Hello and welcome to Alan History Nerd. In this video I'm looking at Protestant opposition to Elizabeth's religious settlement. So whilst Catholic opposition tends to grab all the headlines and all the excitement because, well, they try to do fairly major things like um, kill Elizabeth and blow stuff up and put Mary Queen of Scots on the throne and invade England. So the Catholic one is definitely the more dramatic side, but the Protestant opposition it is a key element of the history of the uh, of, of the church settlement set up by Elizabeth and the, her continued, she con something she continues to struggle against. Now, it's not as dramatic, the, the, there's not assassination attempts, there isn't a, a, a rival potential queen who's going to be put on the throne instead. But one of the things that makes it really interesting and slightly more difficult for Elizabeth is that there are some really key figures in her council who have sympathy for some of those Protestants who are opposing her settlement because they don't think it goes far enough. So before we start looking at, at, at the absolute details in terms of what happens, it, it, it's worth picking up on, on some of the key elements about, well, what is this when we're talking about Protestant opposition? So Catholicism and Catholic opposition I've dealt with in, in a separate video, but in terms of Protestantism, well, you've got the moderate Protestants, which it, it is kind of the area where I would place Elizabeth and I would place her settlement. So she is Protestant in that she is not Catholic and, and she she wants to, to bring in reform to the church. But there are more radical groups in the Protestant, the, the Protestant fold that don't like what Elizabeth does or don't think Elizabeth has done enough. Now, you get more kind of splinters or schisms within Protestantism than you, you do, for example, within Catholicism, because people are encouraged to, to read the Bible themselves and to interpret it themselves, and therefore people read it and see different things. And so you start getting more and more splintering of the Protestant church, and something that then continues in religious history after this point as well. So the key group in all this are the Puritans. Now, the, the Puritans were, were extreme, um, extreme... Protestants, they 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 believed um, the uh, the kind of ideas that that were being put forward needed to be uh, pushed forward, that they needed to be changed, that there was all elements of, of Catholicism, of, of popishness, as they would say, it had to be removed um, from uh, the church. Now, <clears throat> some Puritans, that that was it. They 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 pushed on that bit, and they they continue to push on that bit. And we we see Puritans in Parliament, and we see Puritans in the Council. Now, splintering off these, we've got a couple groups that take it a little bit further. Uh, the first of these are the Presbyterians, and Presbyterianism is is the belief that the the hierarchy imposed on on the church and, and ha, as was in the catholic church with the pope and the cardinals and the archbishops and the bishops and and all the other strands the, 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 there was no no evidence of that in the bible um and so that they wanted they wanted to abolish the this hierarchy they wanted to get rid of the bishops they said there are no bishops in the bible therefore there should be no bishops in the church uh, and and these presbyterians are, are some of the radical groups that, that are push push elizabeth and oppose Elizabeth because they don't believe in the settlement that she has created is a truly Protestant church. So anything with bishops in it is still popish and should be removed. Now, another group that, that split off, or the, or the separatists, and split off is probably the right word, because that's what they wanted to do. They were so disappointed in Elizabeth's church that they wanted to break away from the Church of England and create their own church. Now, it has, you have to be mindful at this time that, that you don't have a whole range of churches you can choose to go to in terms of different denominations and all of that. So um, before the Reformation, before Henry VIII, there was just the Catholic Church and then there was just Henry's Church uh, and then there was just Edward's Church and then there was the Catholic Church again under Mary and now there is Elizabeth's Church. So you couldn't go, when, oh, well, I don't want to go to the, the, the Anglican Church, I'll go to a different one. It was It was the church that the monarch created or nothing, essentially. So this idea that you could create a, a separate church, something that would be widely accepted now, uh, was brand new. Now, one of the most famous bits of writing about this is by uh, a historian known as Sir John Neal, uh, and he argued that the Queen was conscious of the dangerous situation and, and when she made a settlement, and therefore she simply wanted a, a, parliamentary, um, a, a parliamentary majority to confirm the royal supremacy, and then she dissolved Parliament. But then she decided when, uh, when there had been the Treaty of Chateau, uh, of Chateau Cambrais, um, which was by no means a good thing, really, in a lot of ways for England, because it, it confirmed the loss of Calais, and, and we, we then um, 
it, not great terms, but it does mean that there's there's peace in Europe and, and that, that France stopped being a direct threat and they 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 stopped backing uh, Mary Queen of Scots as, in terms of her claim for the English throne. So Elizabeth let Parliament reassemble, and, and part of this was to to prepare the new Protestant form of service. However, the, 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 Neil argues the clergymen in the House of Commons and their, their allies called the Puritan Choir pressured Elizabeth into a much more Protestant prayer book that she wanted, and, and that this this Puritan Choir then continues through uh, Elizabeth's reign in Parliament and pushes her towards a more and more Puritan religious settlement. Now. There's lots of arguments against Neil and lots of uh, historians say, well, actually, we don't see uh, a movement with Elizabeth being driven in any particular direction. Elizabeth creates the church that she wants and, and there are people who think she hasn't gone far enough and there are people who want changes. But actually, this is just Elizabeth's church. And again, this is an area to have a look into because it's an area of, of, uh, of considerable debate. Now we're going to start looking at, at some of the key um, key events. Now one, one of these early on is um, Jules' apology. So and this is from 1562. Uh, uh, Jules was uh, was Bishop of Salisbury. He was a Puritan, and, and he wrote an apology of the Church in England. Now what this meant at the time is apology meant reason justification for something, uh, and he was arguing for the, for the need for a Puritan church. Um, and he claimed that the Puritan branch of the Church of England that was the true church and that would uh, the one that would have been recognised if Jesus and the apostles would turn up and the Catholic Church and, and the, the more moderate Protestant, the moderate Protestant church that Elizabeth uh, followed and a lot of other people in the church wanted uh, and, and followed w was not the true church and, and moved away from biblical faith. Now the fact that the jewel can say right we are the true church within you within the church and a lot of what elizabeth has created is wrong and that come out and outright um, write this and claim this shows that the puritans early on in elizabeth's reign were feeling fairly confident now she did have to rely on them because all the marian bishops had kind of been removed and so she'd had to the 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 Protestants, many Puritans who had escaped from England while during Mary's reign had been brought back in and and they were the leading clergy that she could turn to. So they felt essentially that they could call the shots, that, that Elizabeth didn't have any way to turn and, and therefore they were in a strong position. But this wasn't to prove to be the case. In 63, we, we um, see the convocation uh, and the, the drawing of the 39 articles. Now, the, uh, the convocation is the church's annual parliament. Uh, and the Puritan bishops who turned up in, in 1563 expected Elizabeth to make more Puritan reforms and, and, and assumed that the, the, the Catholic elements that had been left in the, the, the religious settlement in 1559 were not going to be there to stay permanently. Uh, and that was just because she needed to get it to pass and the, 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 the Catholics in powerful positions at the time. And so they started to issue demands and, and elements of popery, or Catholic elements, they wanted removing from the 1559 Book of Common Prayer. They wanted simplification of vestments, investments of the clothing um, that the, 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 the clergy wore. And Elizabeth was really angry about this and she disliked the fact that anybody would challenge her settlement. I mean, she's a Tudor monarch, but somebody challenging her, this is not something that she's likely to accept. And so it's a flat no for Elizabeth on this. Now, she refused to give the, the Puritans what they demanded, but she did publish the 39 Articles, which was the official beliefs of her church. These were heavily influenced by Protestant ideas, uh, and they were based on, on Cramer's art, articles, his 42 articles that he'd, he'd written um, in the reign of Edward. And so we, we do see elements here, and this is where you can start then back jumping for, back and forth the idea of the Puritan choir, that the... Um, it goes back and says the Bible is the key thing. The Bible is the most important thing. It's more important than the church making key decisions. It talks about the key Protestant principle of salvation by faith. And there's also some Calvinism in there, this idea of predestination, the belief that the um, that God predetermines who is going to be saved and go to heaven and who's going to be condemned to hell. So there are some strongly Protestant elements in it. But remember, we're not arguing that the the we're not arguing that Elizabeth is not a Protestant. She's clearly a Protestant. What we're arguing about is whether the Puritans are actually managing to move her. Now, 
there isn't actually proof that they are making much progress here, I don't think. Now, you can definitely say, look, at the, these are, are, are strongly Protestant views, but Elizabeth is Protestant. The, the counter to this is that, that actually the movement of the church is gradually towards a more strongly Protestant one as we go through, and this is a stepping stone in it. And again, this is something you have to uh, have a look at and, and, and make your own mind up on. We then get the Vestarian controversy, which is it's just um, a load of clergy arguing about what dresses they're going to wear. And it does really look like a bit of a, um, a storm in a teacup. But again, we are seeing Protestants challenging Elizabeth and her church. So the act of uniformity told priests to wear a surplus for ordinary services and then owls and copes uh, for communion services. And this is to do, and you can see uh, those bits um, ab above me. So we've got the, the kind of the simple white and black vestments, where, which are the surplus. And then we, we can see the owls and copes, which are, are the, uh, the fancier stuff for communion. And at the convocation, convocation the, the bishops demanded simple investment. Elizabeth refused. She, she liked a bit of pomp and ceremony when it came to her church services. Uh, and the, the um, many priests were refusing to wear the copes during communion services. Some got away with it because the bishops were quite sympathetic to their point of view. However, um, we then see Archbishop Parker in 1964 meeting with Thomas Sampson, the Dean, the Dean of Christchurch, Oxford, to discuss his refusal to wear the official vestments. Uh, in 65, Elizabeth announced that only priests who wore the correct vestments would stay in their jobs, they would keep their livings. So this is becoming quite serious. Parker set up a bishop's inquiry into the problem. Um, but before they could report back, Elizabeth sacks Sampson, sending a very clear line and that it, it's kind of it's my way or the highway and you, you'll where would I tell you? Now, Parker, in response to all this in, in 66, pu published the advertisements. Now, in, in this, he essentially he told the priest just to wear the vestments that Elizabeth wanted them to wear uh, and, that, and administer the communion in surplus. Um, and then we see this this kind of meeting in, in, in London, which is where the, mo the most Protestant, most puritanical Kind of area of the of England at this time, uh, and there the Puritan bishop Grindle reassured the clergy, issuing what was known as a, a, a defora, uh, and this is saying this is not a fundamental issue of belief. So it, God is not bothered what vestments, what clothing you're wearing as you give communion. This is not a big issue. Remember, look look at the thirty nine articles. The thirty nine articles are. Protestant. So what, whether we wear something that you might consider to be Catholic whilst you're doing it is, is not betraying your faith. However, there were still 37 priests who refused to wear the correct vestments and they were removed from their posts. So it's not a huge deal, but it does show that there was debate and discussion and some refusal to go along uh, with uh, Elizabeth Church from the more extreme end of Protestants, the, the Puritans at the Now we see next the admonitions uh, are uh, to Parliament of uh, 1572. Now in 1571, preaching licences had been cancelled. In order to, to get a preaching licence, the clergy had to subscribe to the 39 Articles of the Book of Common Prayer and essentially show their allegiance to Elizabeth's Church and that they were going to do things as she wanted them doing. And some refused to do it and so were deprived of their living. Uh, Thomas Cartwright, and we can see the cheery fellow um, image above us, was one clergyman who was deprived of his living and consequently began to to campaign in, in open opposition um, to, to Elizabeth's church. And he published the two uh, admonitions uh, to, to Parliament in 1572. And so Cartwright really is, is going against the grain, going against Elizabeth. And we can assume if he felt like this, that there were other Puritans at the same time who, who shared his ideas and, and believed that Elizabeth Church wasn't going in the right direction. Um, now, the first uh, admission was, was written by, by John Field and Thomas Wilcox, and these were two dissatisfied, unhappy London uh, clergymen. Uh, they clashed uh, with authorities over vestments and, and the, their writing attacked the, what they called the superstitious practices, such as kneeling and, and the observ observation of Holy Day. So again, there are Catholic elements, which Elizabeth has, has maintained, because she, partly because she's looking for a more balanced church and partly because, because this is what she believes in. 
They also, however, attack the Book of Common Prayer, and they, they say some pretty radical stuff about it. They say it's an imperfect book, and they pick it. And they they talk about it having uh, talk of it being a popish dunghill, or coming it being picked out of that popish dunghill. And they called for the abolition of the church hierarchy, so we can see some Presbyterianism in there. Now Elizabeth is furious about this, uh, but also loads of moderate Protestants were. Now you have to bear in mind this is in 1572, so we've seen the Northern Rebellion in 69. We've seen the excommunication. Uh, in 1570. We've seen the Rodolfi plot in 1571. So the last thing the Protestant church, you would argue, and the, and the Protestant queen needs is Protestant opposition, just when she's trying to deal with this far more serious Catholic opposition. And so Field and Wilcox are promptly arrested by the authorities and spend a year in prison, potentially getting off a little bit lightly there in terms of how strongly they'd opposed Elizabeth. But Again, Protestant opposition is always likely to be treated slightly more lightly than Catholic opposition. The second uh, of these was, was written by Cartwright himself and was a detailed description of the Presbyterian system that he wanted to see uh, brought in. John Whitgift, who was the Vice Chancellor of Cambridge University, challenged uh, these Presbyterian arguments. Cartwright was then provoked into responding and defending him and this led to what is known as the Pamphlet War. Um, which is just people writing angry things against each other. It's a bit like a Tudor Twitter spat. Um, it's So, again, not hugely threatening to anything, but it does show that there was an ongoing debate amongst Protestants in there about the direction of the church and the settlement that had been put in place. Cartwright argues that the church was founded on superstitions and popish principles and therefore was spiritually, spiritually flawed. Wiggins argued that in a perfect, an imperfect world, it was necessary to make certain accommodations to achieve a more godly society. Uh, and although the uh, admonitions uh, attracted the leadership, Presbyterian remained a, a, a kind of a marginal group. It's quite n geographically narrow. It, it was focused mainly in London and, and at the University of Cambridge. Um, and now Whitgift would go on to become the Archbishop of Canterbury. So his, his defence of Elizabeth's church and fighting against Presbyterian was rewarded. And again, we can see this to, to suggest that there is a, a, a strong defence of Elizabeth still at this point in time. Now, the next bit we're going to, going to look at is, is to do with prophesying. Now, and the key figures in, in the key figure in this is Edmund Grindle. Now, Grindle replaced uh, Parker as Archbishop of Canterbury, and Grindle had the support of Lord Burley. So it's the, this is Cecil, and so Cecil's on his side. And if Cecil's on your side, you are in, in a strong position. And, and Grindle encouraged preaching and was relaxed about enforcing conformity. And so we can see here the this kind of more radical Puritan Protestantism and its connection to arguably the most powerful man in England at this time, probably the second most powerful person only behind Elizabeth. But Grindle quarrelled with the Queen over prophesying, and these were unofficial gatherings where preachers developed the skills to, and, and delivery of sermon. And Elizabeth really disliked these because they weren't controlled. And now she much preferred that essentially there, there was a single sermon that would be delivered by everybody all the way through and and therefore that the, the her and the, and the authorities of the church can control what was being said she didn't like prophesying because she didn't know what they were going to say and she was worried that they were going to go against her with good reason in a lot of cases now grindle said prophesying was an effective way of encouraging the word of god and ultimately harmless this was just people talking about theological issues and and, and talking about the bible and so this was all positive now, the Queen, however, said that this, this would encourage radicalism and it was a potential threat to the church. And so we've got a conflict between a monarch and an archbishop. Now, that's not great for the church, but there's only going to be one winner and Grindle is suspended. In the 1580s, we see a group known as the Brownists. Now, they were headed by Robert Brown, so not the most imaginative naming of a group. And they established a separatist congregation in Norwich. Now, this is deemed illegal at the time, and he is imprisoned. And after he gets out of prison, he leaves England and settled in the Netherlands. And there, where he wrote a treatise of reformation without tarrying for any. So again, suggesting 
that the church has not gone far enough. And Brown argued the Church of England was corrupt by its Catholic traces and lack of moral discipline, and said that true Christians should leave Elizabeth's church and, and create a separate gathering of saints who, who would exercise proper discipline and follow a true church. In 83, we see uh, Copping and Thacker being hanged for distributing uh, Brown's pamphlets. So we've seen some imprisoning before and we, we've seen uh, essentially some stern telling off and suspending and losing of your livelihood. But we're now moving into something more serious. And again, we are in the backdrop of Catholic plots and, and, and growing international uh, tension with Spain. And so again, the last thing Elizabeth needs is division amongst Protestants. She needs the Protestants on her side and so any degree of opposition. And this is quite radical opposition. Any degree of radical uh, opposition is not going to be accepted. Now, the Presbyterians in the 1580s are are kind of going well. We we've, we've got um, we've got friends in high places, and maybe we can we can start to make some progress. Maybe now Elizabeth can see the Catholics as the enemy. Maybe she will she'll move over to our side. So of course she has stopped Bishop. Uh, Frack's attempt to suspend the Presbyterians in his in diocese. Uh, Burley appointed uh, Walter Travers as it, his own chaplain. Walter Travers was a, a, a unknown Presbyterian. Uh, Lester uh, and Nollies uh, secured a preaching license uh, for Field, again a Presbyterian. So there are key figures at court, key figures very close to Elizabeth, who are protecting the the Presbyterians and, and essentially the Presbyterians. You're going to have to deal with. You're going to have to you're going to have to put up with them and and listen to us. And they started to become more organised and they set up what were known as classes. And these were gathered, groups that they gathered in, norm, normally about 20 clergy, to discuss common concerns and give each other advice. This is mainly in areas such as Cambridge, Essex and Suffolk. However, these, though these classes met and they did discuss them, whether they were absolutely committed to the introduction of the Presbyterian system and getting rid of the church hierarchy that Elizabeth had established is, is less clear. Uh, and there is some that did see this as, as the starting point of a new uh, Presbyterian structure, but this was the more radical elements. Uh, and they, there was some talk about plans to influence parliamentary elections in, in, in 1586, where again we're talking about we're, we're at the time of Babington plots and things like that in terms of Catholic opposition at this time. Again, I'm not sure that how much there is in all of this. It, 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 there is talk, but there's the, the degree of hard evidence in terms of these men, they were moving to do anything serious and whether they would seriously push against Elizabeth. It was quite a, a challenging time, I think is rather doubtful. There were then two other attempts to use Parliament to bring about change. They, they failed as well. Um, because of the actions of the Speaker of the House at this time was Sir John Puckering uh, and the Privy Council ensured that the bills were was dismissed on both occasions. So we got Wentworth who introduced a bill for the establishment uh, of a Genevan prayer book. So again, more radical prayer book and that fails. And we got Anthony Cope uh, who put forward the same proposal again in 87. So the Presbyterians are trying, but they aren't really getting anywhere. And again, we, we're saying proposals that aren't even they aren't getting any traction really. In 1583 we've got Whitgift's articles. Now Whitgift uh, um, was very much appointed to his, his place as Archbishop of Canterbury because of his art, art opposition to Puritanism which we saw earlier in the video. Uh, in a sermon at St Paul's Cross he likened Puritans to Papists, Anabaptists and rebels. So he goes, well, they're rebelling against the church, so they're as bad as the Catholics are going against the church. Uh, any strategy to demonstrate their behaviour would not be tolerated was, and there was an, an issue, he issued three articles that the clergy had to subscribe to. They had to acknowledge the royal supremacy. They had to agree that the prayer book contained nothing contrary to the word of God. And they had to accept that everything in the 39 articles conformed to the word of God. So he's really trying to hammer home the kind of authority of Elizabeth's church as she's created it. There was, however, a crisis of conscience. For, for many of the clergy, not just the Presbyterians, that gave, some gave a kind of conditional acceptance of the articles in an attempt to save their careers. However, it was not enough for Whitgift. In, in the end, Whitgift had to, to back down because the pressure was imposed on him from the top. And again, we've talked about the, the power that sat behind people, people in high places who had Puritan beliefs, like 
Dudley, Earl, uh, Earl of Leicester, and uh, Sir, uh, and Walsingham, the spy master general. So we've got these really big figures in Elizabeth's council who were backing the Puritan cause. So Article 2 was changed. It said that clergy would agree to use the prayer book, not, not necessarily agree that none of it was against the word of God. So most original non-subscribers now signed up um, and Whitgift saw some victories in his post. So, so Burley's project, uh, George uh, Gifford and Cartwright were both refused a license to preach. And th that is despite Leicester trying to step in. So we are seeing Puritans attempt to make some some changes and and, and we are seeing a pushback from kind of absolute loyalists to Elizabeth's church, such as Whitgift. And despite the interference of some pretty powerful people, the, 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 the Puritans aren't really getting anywhere, making huge amounts of headway. And the next major example we've got it, it are the uh, Mark Plate tracts of 1588 to 1599. And again, this is a, a separatist movement. It, it's, it's in the form of Martin Mark. Uh, Mar uh, Marpolate's attracts a, a bit an attack, a bitter, bitter attack on the church, uh, and attacking the idea of the bishops. Uh, the pamphlets were anomalous, uh, so it wasn't clear who'd written them. They were published in London. Even um, Puritans like Cartwright were horrified by the tracts. The, the reactions of authorities and, and public allowed the Privy Council to bring about the final destruction of the separatist church. That the, the, again, you have to remember, we here we are at the time of the Armada, and we've got people. On from the Protestant side attack, attacking the church as well. So government propaganda then links to Puritanism and separatists uh, and and, uh, and they, they go kind of like this extreme form of radicalism. This is attacking the church. It's attacking our queen. It, 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 it's unpatriotic, all that kind of stuff. So Cartwright was made to stand before the court of high commission and reveal what, what he knew about prophesizing all these ideas that were going on and spreading. And then we get in the 1590s, 1593, we get the Acts Against the Digis, uh, uh, Secret Sectaries, uh, and this law allowed the authorities to execute anyone who, who was suspected of being a separatist. And again, this is fairly dire judgment. You can say allowed to execute anyone suspected of being a separatist. And this is putting being a separatist on the same level as being a, um, a Catholic at this point in time. So the situation by 1603 is, is essentially there is a broad consensus surrounding the Church of England that it, that it is seen as now the rightful church and there is a, a degree of religious unity. Separatists had virtually disappeared. Um, most Puritans had assimilated into the mainstream and accepted all the key aspects of Elizabeth's church. Uh, and this is, is partly the consequence of pl key political figures such as Lesser and Mild May and Walsingham uh, dying, and therefore that they, they, this real pu push and, and conflict uh, being withdrawn. And part of it is is to do with the defeat of the Spanish Armada, uh, and essentially people going right. Look, if if God didn't think this was the one, if this wasn't the true faith and this wasn't how the English Church should be, then he wouldn't have uh, have, have blown the Armada, of course. And smash it against those rocks. Um, so people in England at this point then kind of go, well, actually, this is the right thing. And also this goes back to Elizabeth's in initial intentions, that she believed that time was the key thing, that, that if you establish a church and then you stayed on the throne for long enough, you go through generations. And then as the new generations come in, then the only church they've ever known is this. And therefore that becomes the orthodox, that becomes what they cling to. And we've seen that with the other Tudors where when change is brought in, there's a reaction against it because it goes against what people are used to. Now, what people are used to is Elizabeth's church, and therefore that you get that kind of public reaction against those who want to bring about radical change. I hope that's been helpful for you and giving you a, a quite a detailed look there at what's an opposition to Elizabeth's church. Again, a huge thank you goes out to Fran, who's um, helped me put this together. And if you're interested in all things religious, then checking out Fran's uh, channel on the New Testament. New Testament Explained is a really good place for more stuff on that. Um, 
if you've liked the video, please hit the like button. If you've got any comments, then put, please leave those. And if you haven't done so already, then please do subscribe. There's loads more videos on the channel on Tudor England and other aspects of history, all designed for A-level history students. So we've got stuff on uh, the American Civil War. We've got stuff on Tsarist and Communist Russia. We've got stuff on um, the making of modern Britain. And we've got some some stuff on um, the, the American, American unit of... Uh, of uh, post Second World War America, the the, uh, the American Dream. So any of that stuff that interests you, then check out the channel. There's also a load of politics stuff on there as well, uh, designed for A-level politics. Thank you very much for watching.